Chapter 5 Shortages Like most people of my age, I had a good education, that is, I was fed all the liberal myths and illusions as gospel truth, and I was fed them ably. I was just beginning junior high school at the beginning of the 1930s when I was taught that, by the time I would be 21 years old, the world's coal and oil deposits would be exhausted. I was warned that it was necessary for my generation to face up to the fact of this coming world disaster. Of course, the world's total known deposits of coal and oil were far less then than they are now. But the same horror story of a world blackout of a cold and energyless world population is still with us. In recent years, I've spoken to this junior high indoctrination to a number of people of my age and younger. Perhaps, I reasoned, I had a few teachers of rather dim outlook, and others may have been better taught. To the contrary, I found that such teaching had been commonplace from at least the 1930s to the present. I hardly need add that it is very prevalent today. Such thinking has been well answered in a number of able books. We live in a world of disaster by expectation and disaster by state decree. There is, for all such people, a scareful and alarming fact about creation. There is a built-in scarcity. Earlier humanism tended to operate on the premise of infinite resources. In the 20th century, especially after mid-century, opinion began to favour the scarcity doctrine. Now, it is true this world is a limited world. Infinity and infinite power and resources belong only to God. The very fact of creatureliness limits both man and the universe. Man finds this a disaster only because he dreams of being as God, and to be anything less is for him an evil. To live in the world God made is to live in a world of shortages which only man can relieve. Adam faced a world of radical shortages on day one of man's history, a shortage of tools, of housings, of furnishings, of tableware, of everything. True, he had a garden full of fruit, but no stepladder, no bucket or bushel basket. Have you ever tried to shimmy up a fruit tree with a naked butt? Anyone who has ever picked peaches know how fuzzy peaches are on a tree and how that fuzz clings to the flesh and itches. There is no relief short of bathing. A scratched and itchy Adam must have spent more than a little time cleaning up in one or another of Eden's four rivers, Pison, Gihon, Hittichel and Euphrates. No doubt, more than once before his first meal and after, he must have wondered why God did not provide him with more equipment. The landlord had placed him in a situation of appalling shortages. Of course, it was intentional. The potentialities in the world are, while not infinite, more than man can ever develop in the long history of time. To be developed, these potentialities require work and intelligence and a progressive capitalization. The key, as Edward A. Powell points out, is finding where the potentialities are. Disaster faced the world of the 19th century with its radical dependency on whale oil until oil was first discovered and bought out of the earth. Since then, a series of previously once unknown or unimagined potentialities have led to new sources of power, energy and technology. From Eden on, the world has always faced potential or actual shortages. Economic progress means overcoming shortages by implied intelligence and work. One area of total shortage facing Adam in Eden was money. None existed. This was only natural, of course. Before there can be money, there must be work. There must be the production of wealth and exchange by means of a trustworthy medium of exchange, which is gold. Not surprisingly, two verses in Genesis 2, verses 11 and 12, tell us where gold was to be found. Modern fiat money represents wealth just as a snapshot represents a house or a man pictured therein, but it is neither. This is why it always inflates and becomes progressively worthless. Sound money does not merely represent wealth, it is wealth. The gold ruble of the Tsars is still valued money, but their paper money is worthless except as a curio. 
Gold as money, like every other form of wealth, has a price. It costs something to mine and refine. In brief, it is costly money. However, the goal of the humanitarian statist is costless money. The value of the costless money to men is that it enables the state to enact legislation and controls with powers previously unobtainable except by brute force, and inadequately even then. Costless money appears as a bonanza for all, a means of eating one's cake and having it too. J. Frieri Andrade, in commenting on our modern costless paper money, observed with respect to its consequences, quote, First, work is not the only way to earn a living. Secondly, work can receive a value independently of the worth society attributes to the services rendered. That is, a situation arises where we have no voice as individual members of society in setting the value of the work of others. End quote. Costless money is state money, state capital, and it leads to state-ordained projects and state-controlled economics. This is now not only a national but an international fact of economic life because people are taxed directly and indirectly by inflation to provide for world growth and supposedly world economic stability. As a result, we face a world of government-made economic structures where, in Dandrade's words, quote, all countries have built the life of their communities upon an entirely artificial structure, end quote, one of the purposes of costless money is to relieve world hunger and eliminate shortages. One of its consequences, finally, is to create massive and sometimes artificial shortages and hunger. The shortages are artificial when goods are withheld finally from the market or go to the market in inferior form because the money is becoming worthless. Production is perverted by a number of causes but on the whole and in the main by status policies and intervention. War can pervert production dramatically by creating artificial barriers and artificial markets within those barriers. Debt also perverts production, often dramatically, and certainly since World War II this has been a major factor in preventing production. Finally, costless money is the decisive and continuing form of perverting production. It does more than pervert production. It perverts and destroys civil orders, rulers and nations. It has not been sufficiently stressed that Louis XVI, in refusing to follow the Council of Durgo, his finance minister, that there be, quote, no bankruptcies, no new taxes, no loans, end quote, ensured his own downfall. In dismissing Durgo, he dismissed his own future, an act of dismissal being repeated everywhere today. It was to Napoleon's credit that he refused that course and told his first cabinet, quote, I will pay cash or nothing, end quote. Napoleon held, quote, national debt as immoral and destructive, silently undermining the basis of the state. It delivers the present generation to the execration of posterity, end quote. Moreover, he held, quote, while I live, I will emit no paper, end quote, meaning both bonds and paper money. Not surprisingly, Napoleon had no popularity with the other powers of his day. Weber, in his excellent study, Grow or Die, comments, quote, In essence, to say that we are running out of resources means, according to sociologist Ben J. Wattenberg, that, quote, The one key resource, the intellect of man, is running dry, but that is not happening, end quote. What we do have a shortage of is the morality to resist the economics of Satan, to resist costless money, debt and statist nostrums. We want men in the world to be saved by shortcuts and by fiat answers devised by man. Shortages are less a problem now than they were in Eden. The problem is man, and man is a sinner. He dreams of being God, of creating out of nothing, so that he can have something for nothing. He governs his life his economics and his politics in terms of that dream. Century after century he has attempted to impose his status dream or nightmare on history only to create disaster upon disaster. He will not learn. He refuses to learn. After all, you can teach a god nothing. 
only when man becomes again a man in Jesus Christ, when he surrenders the madness of his dream to be God, can he deal, by means of intelligence and work, with the problem of shortages. The problem is at root a moral problem, and it requires a moral answer.